the purpose of the talk is really to, to kind of bring up the topic of how do we explain this to patients? What are your tips and tricks for the most common questions? How do I address them? How could you address them better? Um, I, you know, this is the dilemma in the clinic is um, you're, we're outnumbered, you know, so if I have a 45 minute consult, that's weighed against 20 hours Googling around and um, sometimes you're out, you know, weight on that. So, so I love that. Don't confuse your Google search with my medical degree. Uh, how do we point them in the right direction? So I've actually done a book on robotic prostatectomy and, and the nice thing that Springer let me do is I, they let me do anything I wanted for this book. It was so unedited I could just craft it. So yes, there's how to do the operation sections, but then I just, it was a place I could put all, any, every, any other content I thought was interesting to this space, you could just put it in the book somewhere. So for example, I took my patient handout and just converted that into a generic, how do I counsel patients? Here's what I tell them. And then if you could just follow the chapter through, you could just insert your program's information uh, and go down the, the line on that. Now, I, I still use neutral sites. I think the big thing to emphasize is get them off of market-based internet searches and onto like Urology Care Foundation has put a lot of effort into patient counseling. That's a fairly neutral site. I actually think AUA guidelines are relatively readable to lay audience. They're not written with that purpose in mind. Urology care are, they are, they are written, so they have to pass the whole like fifth grade reading level or whatever the rule is. AUA guidelines are not, but I find most patients can follow that. Maybe that's a Houston bias. Um, so here are the 10 grouped questions that people often ask the most. Obviously, what are mortality and morbidity benefits? Continence and potency questions. What are the techniques available? Everybody asks how long it takes. Have you ever noticed that? Like, it's like a big deal. Does it take one, two, three hours? I don't think they even know what answer makes. I mean, if you told them a radical prostatectomy takes me 20 hours, they might say, well, let's, maybe we should go get a fifth opinion or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, the, the subtle answer, it's just such a common question, you know. How long is recovery? And they always say recovery. And then you're like, well, which recovery? You know, I mean, in the hospital, I mean, you almost just say there's 10 layers of recovery to go through, and so you just do that. Some of them actually are, if they're really a little obsessive compulsive, will then get beyond the surgery and already start previewing, you know, the post-surgical. I'll do a little bit of the radiation dilemma. After a certain point, I'm like, let's not feel your gut. Um, and some, actually very few ask about hormonal therapy, but it's worth bringing up. And then everybody asks, how much have you done? So I put it in the back of the handout very humbly. It's in there, but otherwise it's just going to be asked anyway. So the mortality morbidity, I like to use the Bill Axelson study. And what study has gotten into the New England Journal three times? Same study because it's so unique. There was a, you know, when, it, when round one was uh, published, Pat Walsh was on the horn touting, you know, finally we have level one evidence that surgery works. <laughs> I've been doing it for 20 years. Hey, great, it works. Um, if you read round two, there were some subtle hints that there was some palliative care benefit. It was sort of like buried in the tables, but it's very explicit in round three on mortality benefits and then morbidity, you know, palliative care. So let's just quickly highlight that. You know, it was, in the, again, this was not surveillance. This is like observation, come back when you're metastatic versus RP. Um, so, you know, the, the methods are out there for a while. If you had to give them one figure, absolute difference, there it is, 12% absolute difference in the trial, mortality, surgery versus observation. I usually don't give patients relative risk ratios, but you could if you wanted to. Um, and yes, you can go through the same layer of, of data in prostate-specific uh, mortality. The first one was overall. Distant METs, same idea overall. But the palliative treatment's interesting, and I'll, I'll cut to the chase on that. In men under age 65, they had essentially all of the mortality benefit. Overage did not. So this is a useful thing to tell a 73-year-old, and I usually say something to the effect of, I'm not sure surgery or radiation for that matter is gonna mathematically make you live longer, but it might steer you off of hormonal therapy, palliative care, progression, metastasis, that kind of thing. And a really healthy 73-year-old, I think if they understand, you know, the odds are stated that way, you know, can make an informed decision on that. Um, but then again, if you're trying to do, put a 75-year-old through surgery for a millimeter of six, then you have to really qualify. This is really more of a BPH operation for you, you know. Um, so those are some of the conclusions you can go with Bill Axelson. Uh, I'll skip the stuff on screening there. This slide, I, I keep wanting to convert it into a better slide, but I would say that um, 
I usually put in there, not on the mortality benefit, but if you, like, so this is, uh, the short version of that, if you have a 68-year-old fit who's got a little bit of 3 plus 4 and is you're favoring treatment, let's say, I usually give them a very neutral surgery radiation. Like, there is no medical reason why one's going to be any different than the other. They're both going to cure really high. They're both going to be better than surveillance at keeping you off of hormones and progression. And this could be literally your preference, logistics, schedule. I mean, you can give them all sorts of other reasons for it. Now, this is a slide that Laurie Klotz put together, and it just shows these large populational data sets of surgery versus radiation, and all of them favor surgery, and all of them are biased, and radiation oncologists would be stomping their feet if I even showed this. But I think most of it, if you look at least three or four of the studies, most of that's driven by Gleason 4 plus 3 or higher, and the fact that probably 5 to 1 ratio biochemical recurred surgical patients will do radiation salvage versus the other way around. So if you salvage the nasty tumors better with surgery, then in, in sort of an intent to treat way of thinking, surgery might be better if you took the same patient and said they have Gleason 8 or something like that. Or you can at least present that argument to them because, yeah, they could do radiation and fail and have to have, you know, salvage. So you have to kind of get, I think, a little bit in that if you're going to decide whether or not you're going to really say surgery is your best choice versus it's just sort of an equal choice. Uh, so anyway, incontinence and, and risk, and then this is one in the 10-minute version I can't do, but I use the EPIC data. And I'll fast forward to a couple tricks that I think are buried in the literature, but I think are gold gems for this. So um, yes, you need to go through the epic data about baseline and follow up, and we've got historic data. And this is the Sanda New England paper, and I highlight these from here. So this is the surgery curve, and yes, nerve sparing had better potency than non-nerve sparing. This is brachytherapy, you know, with or without hormones, similar. But look at external beam. Once you added hormone therapy, same the I hinted on the other talk, they had the similar potency results as non-nerve sparing surgery, actually, in that study. So it depends on, and you know, that's the thing, now that they have Gleason 6, there's fewer people getting external beam monotherapy anyway. They might get brachy for Gleason 7. In fact, I usually look at this curve and say, if you're a really good brachy candidate and you wanted radiation, I would do the brachy if someone's good at it and then get not do the six months of ADT. Um, we've done subscales based on age, and yes, age, uh, younger people baseline higher and recover higher, um, but there's no age or baseline function that has no sexual side effects, in case you ever wanted to look for that. And then there are older studies with EPIC. You can go through, again, all that line-for-line -line data, and there's an amazing amount of similarity at baseline EPIC scores. You know, almost everyone has, like, 90 on the urine score and 55 to 60 on the sexual function, and it doesn't change anywhere. You know, the post-op could change, but the baseline is fairly stable. It's exactly the same in the Yaxley study, for example. This is a health um, outcome study that's a good one. You know, it's a lot of lines of text to go over, but if you do the fine print, it's helpful. And we've done some internal data I'll skip over that we've done. Here's the gem in all this. As a secondary paper of the PROSQA study from Mar Marty Sanda, they went the next level basically saying, well, outside of statistical significance, because we all know if you've got 20,000 patients, you can make any two numbers statistically significant. But they did a, a sort of a standard deviation and an anchor-weighted uh, dual assessment of what would be clinically significant. And it varies by scales, and those are just some figures from the paper. Here's the punchline. A six to nine point difference in urinary incontinence is clinically significant, whereas 10 to 12 points on sexual function is clinically significant. So assuming that everyone has almost the same baseline, if you look at your post-op recovery scores, you can benchmark them to all sorts of published data and use that table to show if any of it even matters. The reason why I point this out is, at least in my patients, we get them really right within that six to nine point window on on urinary scale. I mean, the outliers are outside of it, but they're basically in that clinically a non-significant window. Now, on potency, it's all over the place. Some are inside of 10 to 12, and some are not. And if you look at the ages and the ranges and all this stuff, here's how I do it as one slide in the clinic. Basically, you would say for urinary, irritation and, uh, and obstruction improves after surgery. We all know that. There are small groups of declines in incontinence, like the 10 to 15 percent minor, 1 percent major, and last time we checked, only 0.4 percent get surgical um, interventions. Sexual function, it's all over the place. There is a nice survey study from Mulhall's group showing that 
we actually don't do a good job of counseling on comprehensive sexual functions, so remind them about a dry ejaculate. Um, climax is mostly preserved, but gets described in 10 different ways. Uh, more intense, I never understand more intense. I've heard that, right? More intense, less intense, shorter, longer, it's all over the place. At least bring the topic up. Fertility, extraordinarily expensive if you don't send them to Lipschultz Lab to bank ahead of time. Uh, and then, the, so I think, I, 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 I don't tell any patient a single potency metric or that they'll reach baseline, because I, I mean, it could happen. But I think pa everyone who's had prostatectomy can tell they've had a prostatectomy, right? So I usually say, if you have a great outcome, maybe you're 10% down from your baseline, but the adverse risk features, age over 65, mild ED, more advanced stage, you can throw in surgical technique, you, you might quickly, 10% could quickly balloon into 50%. So you try to look at all that and, and give them an honest estimate of where they might land. So my time expired, but I can say that um, on all these other things, these are, it's a good opportunity to, to make some written materials. It's a mixture of what's out there in the literature that's fair and neutral. You can use guidelines-based structure, fill in your type numbers. We've got all sorts of other. We have a lot of program statistics we give them, not because we're trying to brag or tell them that. It's just that we have those numbers because we have to have them to buy robots. Um, so I just go ahead and throw in a bunch of robotic, you know, program vital statistics. Just, you know, why not? Gives them something to read. So we've ex exceeded time, but anyway, I think uh, the, the, the technique of counseling prostate cancer does, um, is, is, a, is a good area. We don't really talk about it so much, but I would put some time into it. Certainly helps workflow. All right, thank you.